Hello, and I want to say a special hi and greetings to our brothers and sisters in Gander Baptist Church who are watching this via video and anyone who may be viewing this over the internet. Greetings and welcome to you all. We have had a great Easter season. We have come through um, a three or four weeks preparing up to Easter on our message series called Building Bridges. We had great services and events happening throughout Easter weekend last weekend. We had a wonderful Good Friday service that was so well attended. And uh, we, I feel that we all walked away having that new sense of Jesus, the cross of Christ being the bridge um, between us and God. And so it was a meaningful and moving service, I believe. And then Saturday morning, boy, we went from kind of mourning, as in, you know, uh, thinking of that con contemplative time of Jesus dying on the cross to clearing the cheers aw chairs away here and we had bouncy castles we had carnival games going and as pastor jeffrey said we had well over 160 people come through our church and many of them were from our Froud Avenue Community Center community. So we were so excited about that. I think I didn't know more people than I knew, actually, if you understand what I mean by that. There were so many new faces and so many wins going on as we continued to build a bridge to our community here. So that was really exciting. And then Easter Sunday morning, we invited people to cross the bridge, to take that moment, to make that decision, to decide to say yes to Jesus who loves us and who wants to bring that connection back between us and God. So I just want to celebrate that. And I know that many are away for the Easter break and enjoying a time of refreshment too. So I just love joining God when he's at work. It's an exciting adventure. Now for these next two weeks, we're just doing a little mini series called New Things, Joining God's Adventure. How many here like to try new things? You can raise your hand. How many like to try new things? Okay, I would say, how many don't like to try new things? I was going to say those who are honest. <laughs> you know, I like to think of myself who likes, uh, as a person who likes to try new things. I think of myself as, you know, I want to try new things, always sort of experimenting and all of that. But... That all fades away when I'm sitting in the Irving Big Stop and I order the same clubhouse sandwich with fries. Every time. And so I wonder, do I really like to try new things? Um, trying new things can be so uncomfortable, right? It's uncomfortable. As followers of Jesus, though, we are constantly being nudged to do new things, to consider a new perspective. We are constantly being nudged to, um, to maybe even uh, start living a new way of living our lives as well. That's what being a follower of Jesus is all about. It's about new things. And you'll notice that even if the new things are for the better, if that new thing is for the better, it still feels uneasy, doesn't it? It still feels uncomfortable. We may even be disoriented. I often wonder sometimes if we completely reconfigured the seating in this sanctuary and people walked in, it would be so disorienting, wouldn't it? And I even challenge you, maybe sit in a different section. Wow, but, but that's uncomfortable, isn't it? We get comfortable being, uh, doing the same thing. But the story of our lives and even of our church is that God is always doing new things. He's not content to allow us to stay the same. He is not. And he's not content that our church stays the same either. We are to be constantly renewed in our minds and in our ways of thinking. And as a church, to be open to the Spirit's leading when we see God so obviously at work in places where he, I believe, is inviting us to join him. So today we're going to look at a passage in the book of Isaiah. And it talks about God doing a new thing. And the book of Isaiah is found in the Old Testament. If you have your Bibles with you or your Bible in app form, you can turn now to Isaiah 43. And just to give you some background, Isaiah was a prophet. And that is someone who spoke on behalf of God. So God gave the message to Isaiah, and then Isaiah spoke the message to either the kings or the people, however God instructed him. 
Isaiah lived and ministered in Jerusalem. And a fascinating fact, the name Isaiah means the Lord saves. I like that. That's a great name. And as a prophet of God, his messages, how his messages were received, really depended on the disposition of the person who was receiving the message. So if it wasn't a godly king that Isaiah was prophesying to or bringing a message to, uh, that message would be rejected, which would always lead to trouble for God's people in the end. And when it was a godly king, Isaiah's message was received well and welcome. And often the godly king would actually seek out the advice of a prophet, and particularly during times of crisis. So it's recorded that the people of Israel mocked him and made fun of him when he would bring a message of correction or warning to the people. So as a prophet of God, I don't really think Isaiah had it very easy. What do you think? Imagine bringing messages of correction and warning, bringing messages to people who aren't listening, how much fun that would be. Yeah, not so much. So the passage I'm going to take a look at is Isaiah 43, 16 to 21. It's right in the middle of that chapter. And scholars say that Isaiah chapters 40 to 55 were written during the late 6th century. And that was the time when Judah was suffering under Babylonian rule. And one scholar explains, some of the people had been taken into exile in Babylon, while others remained in the land, but both groups suffered to varying degrees the debilitating effects of being a conquered people. And one of the tasks of the prophet was to rebuild the people's understanding of themselves as God's own people and to reassure them that their God was fully capable of taking on the Babylonian superpower in order to save them. So that kind of sets the stage. I'm going to pray now and then we're going to take a look at this passage. So let's pray. Uh, God, we just ask that you would help us to understand your message here this morning through your word. We know your word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our paths, so we are listening, uh, Father, for you. We thank you for your word in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you take a look at the beginning of Isaiah 43, it starts out with Isaiah reassuring God's people that he is with them. I mean, this is a common theme that God wants to get through to his people. I am with you. Do not be afraid. I'm with you even in captivity. And in verse 11 it says, I, even I am the Lord. And apart from me there is no Savior. He's the only one. He's putting together another rescue plan as he reveals himself in verse 15 as your Holy One. Israel's creator and your king. I love that. So let's read verses 16 to 21 right now. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and reinforcements together, and they lay there, never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. God always blesses the reading of his word. Don't you think it's so cool that it's so neat that we've just come through the first 15 chapters of Exodus that describe that big event in the history of God's people where he saved them out of Egypt from slavery and walked them through the Red Sea. And here we see Isaiah reminding them of this story right in the front there. Right at the beginning of the passage, he's referring to that pivotal event that the people, uh, that, of what God did for the people in rescuing them out of slavery. And then he commands the people. This isn't just a suggestion, folks. Maybe you should forget. I wonder, would it be wise if you would forget? This is a command. This is not a suggestion. 
He commands the people. He says, forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a what? I'm doing the same old, same old. I'm doing a new thing. I'm doing a new thing. And one scholar says it this way. The past can teach and illustrate, but it must not bind. The Lord always has greater things in store. He is revealed in the past, but he's always more than the past revealed. Then, I love it, because he uses the wilderness and wanderings images, how God miraculously provided a way for the Israelites while they were in the desert. He made a way for them in the wilderness with streams in the wasteland. He's bringing life out of lifelessness. And he provides for the wild animals. I don't know why he chose jackals and owls, but fair enough. Um, And he provides for his people. Not just any people, his chosen. And I love the imagery of God forming the people for himself like a potter who forms something out of clay. This intimate, hands-on God who created his people, formed them and molded them that they may proclaim his praise. It's a great message of hope. A great message of hope to God's people that he has rescued them in the past And in his mercy, in spite of their history, of continually not listening to him, of continuing disobeying him, disobeying his commands, which is why they were in captivity in the first place, he will rescue them out of captivity again. And they are to remember that they belong to him and that he makes a way in impossible circumstances. God specializes in impossible circumstances. He loves to do that. We think it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And their identity as a people is to be found in who God says they are. He has formed them for himself. You are mine. You are my beloved. God is doing something new. Do you perceive it? He's doing a new thing. And for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we're always being challenged to enter into new experiences. Have you found that on this grand adventure of following Jesus? You'll find yourself always being challenged into new experiences, new places, new opportunities. And not just for the sake of doing something new, but the essence of spiritual growth means that we're changing We need to be changing. We're being transformed by Jesus, growing more and more to become like him. That's the whole point of life, is to become more and more like Christ. But it's challenging for us, as I've said before, isn't it? To try new things. I don't know about you, but I like the certainty of the same old, same old. There are hundreds of other food items on that big stop menu, but I'm going to stick with what I know. It's safe. I know I like it, and I know what I'm getting. There's no surprises. There's no risk. You roll your dice, you move your mice. Nobody gets hurt. Easy. But the problem is, when we resist new things and hold on to former things, we can get stuck. We can get stuck, stuck in our old ways. You know, maybe bored even and discouraged thinking there must be something more. And maybe even forgetting who we are in Christ and that we are to be on mission and we're stuck. Maybe God today wants to get your attention so he can do something new in your life. God says to us, forget the former things. Don't dwell on the past. See, I'm doing a new thing. It's not easy to leave what we know and go to a new place. It's not easy to try something new that God may be calling you to and make that change you know has to happen. It's scary. It's uncomfortable. It seems risky. There's too much effort. It's too hard. It's easier to stick with what you know, isn't it? 
But if you're following Jesus, life is all about new things. In fact, life becomes more of an adventure that, you, that he, he can take you to places you would never imagine. That's why we've titled this series, New Things, Joining God on Adventures. If we dare to, we can find ourselves doing things we never thought we'd be doing in places we never dreamed we'd be going. Folks, I'm a living example of that. Who'd have thunk it? Little girl from St. John in Brunswick grows up, moves to Moncton, Moncton, gets called as a pastor there, serves in ministry for 20 plus years there, and oh, hello, how would you like to move to Newfoundland? How would you like to be the senior pastor of this church? New things. I got to tell you, my first answer was no. (laughs) Got to be honest. You're joking, right? But boy, am I glad. I didn't miss it. I am on it. We, my family, is on an adventure here. This church is on an adventure. It's so exciting. And not only do we as individuals struggle trying new things, it can be true for churches too, right? Can you say yes to that? Yeah, like, no offense, but us church people have a hard time with new things. It's tough. You can walk into some churches and nothing's ever changed. I took a course one year on church renewal, and the professor jokingly said, you know, if the 1950s ever return, some churches will be ready. (laughs) Right? Churches struggle to try new things. And in fact, I've heard some say, with the rate of the world changing around us, that the church is the one place where we can come and know that everything's going to be the same. And I guess that's fine if you're a church person with a church background. But if you are someone new walking in, it's like a time warp. What is this? And remember that the old saying about the seven words that will kill the church? Anybody know it? We've we've never done it that way before. I know you all know it. Right? We've never done it that way before. And one author writes, now listen to this. They say, human families and communities are designed to create stability for their members. Churches are no different. Perhaps sometimes they are much worse. Isaiah 43 compels us to view our experience of God's grace in the past as a springboard so that we view neither present nor future with fear, but with expectation. This is wonderful and very necessary word for the church to hear in this current age when there is so much change and upheaval. The character of our God, however, has not changed. God's grace and power have sustained us in the past and will see us through the present and guide us into the future. That's a great word, a great word. God is always doing a new thing. He's trying to move us out of our comfort zones into those places that will actually test our trust in him, that will test our love for him, to remind us of who we are and who he is, and to push us to step out in obedience so that he can work through us. Did you know he wants to work through you? The God of the universe wants to work through you. Wants to work through me. Uh, Really? He does. We are his plan. Plan A, there's no plan B. He wants to work through us as individuals. He wants to work through us as a church, as a collective. So what new thing is God calling you to? What former things is he telling you to stop dwelling on? Stop dwelling on the former things. I know many of us have some painful stuff in our past, and maybe that's what's keeping us from doing that new thing. Or maybe it's just fear alone, and that just keeps us paralyzed, and we're afraid to do that new thing. Maybe our circumstances don't say, yeah, go ahead and do that new thing. Maybe our circumstances are telling us it seems that we shouldn't, but we should. And I believe that God is doing a new thing in our church in this moment in history. Don't you perceive it? You know, when I think of all the new things that he's doing in our church, it's a lot, isn't it? 
there's so much new going on here. And I think of even Pastor Jeffrey coming on staff in October and all the new things that, that God is doing through his ministry. That he's brought some new ideas. He's doing renovations to our children's area. New ways to minister to parents, to youth, and to children. New opportunities to serve our community through our renewed relationship with Froud Avenue. God is doing a new thing. And it's stirring our church. It's challenging us to look out beyond the walls. And then I think of the big new thing. And for those of you who are visiting here today, or guests... Yeah, we're entering into a multi-site relationship with Gander Baptist Church. And in March, both churches voted for Gander becoming part of West End. And right now, we're sharing the Sunday preaching with them via video each week and making regular connections. And it's exciting what God's doing. And our plan now, our next step is to begin a campaign to raise funds to renovate Gander Baptist Church and to call a pastor to lead that congregation. It's crazy. It's scary. It's new. But God's promise of bringing streams of water into a wasteland, we may see our resources right now as a wasteland as the desert is dried up. But if he's called us to it, he's going to provide a way. He's going to bring streams of living water. And we're going to follow him and join him. And you know what's so cool is that our denomination is fully behind us and actually investing in our multi-site partnership with them. And they're ready to invest in the future when we're ready to call a pastor there. Are you excited about this? Tell your faces. It's exciting, and it's exciting to see Joseph and Glenda here from Gander Baptist Church here this morning. We are partnering with your church, and we are, you're becoming, we are becoming a one church with different locations, and it's so exciting to think of. God is making a new way through the desert. He's making streams of water, bringing new life to both congregations through this multi-site and the changes that this multi-site model brings. It's so exciting, but it is so scary because it's new. And now, we've begun the process of finding a new name for our church. A new name that reflects this new day of being one church with different locations. We have a name change team who've been actively offering opportunities for everyone to participate and submit possible new names for our church. And we've gotten some doozies. And uh, yeah, I'm just going to tell you a couple that didn't make the short list when we met. Carolyn's Cabin, caught. Hogwarts, gone. Sorry, you Harry Potter fans. But the team has suggested that today I just, as part of this new things message, just clarify why we need a new name for our church in this new chapter. First, God is doing a new thing. Don't you perceive it? And as our name change team met, we came up with some reasons, and I'm going to share them with you because I know that there's still some people saying, why are we doing this? What's on the go? Well, we want a name that says who we are. Not just where we are, we're not limited to any geographical area, and it allows for our multi-site model. So we can't be West End Baptist Church and tell Gander Baptist Church to be West End Baptist Church. And we can't be Gander Baptist Church because we're not in Gander. And so we need a name that's not just not identifying geography, but more about who we are. We're becoming a regional church and Gander will also come under that new name and we want to engage Gander in that process of helping to submit names. It's exciting. And then for some, and this is just for some, and this is not to be offensive here, so this is not why I'm saying this, but the tag Baptist, that denominational tag, has negative connotations for some. For some, they won't even enter into our church to hear the gospel and, and to because of that tag that is there in a name. And I know this is very concerning to some, especially those perhaps in our older generation, maybe some in the younger generation. So guess what? I got on the phone last week and I talked to a couple of our CBAC pastors who've gone through a name change just like we are. 
And so the main reasons for both of them was that their current names had limited them. It brought limits. First of all, geographically. One was Main Street Baptist Church. You can't get any more Baptist than that. You're talking a hundred plus year old church, Main Street Baptist, right? And the other one was Newcastle United Baptist Church up in the Miramichi. And both churches were on the move. Main Street was leaving their old building and building a brand new church building. Oh, what a dream that would be. And so they were moving, and so they knew that with all the change that was happening, this was a good time to change their name because Main Street is a geographical place, right? They were no longer going to be on Main Street. And so they start the process that it was the right time to look for a new name. And I love what one of the consultants explained to that church. They said, a name is a container and it gets filled with lots of positive memories and it fills up over time. I think West End Baptist has been a container, hasn't it? It's filled up over time with positive memories. Gander Baptist, same thing. It's been a container. But for those who aren't inside the church, who are actually, who are supposed to be, who are serving, and why we exist for those who have yet to come, those who are outside the church, that container may hold some very negative connotations. I appreciated that analogy. I just thought, hmm, there's something to that. And so here's the name they chose, just to give us some inspiration. River Cross Church. I thought that was really cool. Um, Rob Nyland, the senior pastor, he said, the river is co a common metaphor in the Bible that flows to God's presence. He said, and, and when God's presence flows, life abounds. And he wanted their church, if they were present in the community, to see their community flourish and have life abounding. And he said they removed the Baptist tag because of their context. It was a barrier to people coming. And he assured the congregation they weren't changing their Baptist theology. They weren't leaving the denomination. That all remains the same. And then Reverend Kevin Matthews from the former Newcastle United Baptist Church said they re removed the term Baptist because while it used to mean something back in the day, in their context, they had five Baptist churches who all had different Areas of belief. So it was confusing to people. What kind of Baptist are you? I don't know. And so it was just confusing for the regular person. And especially when the first thing, and this is what he mentioned to me, and I don't know, I haven't Googled it, but maybe after church you can Google this. He says, the first thing that comes up on Google is Westboro Baptist Church when you put Baptist Church in the Google engine. And I don't know about you, I don't want to be... <laughs> There's some bad associations that, that are there. So he said, this might limit what God could do. And they didn't want that. They changed their name to the Point Church. Look at this. Do we have that slide, Israel? Yeah. The Point Church. They're pointing people to Jesus, people to Christ. And Kevin said that this name change has opened up so many doors over the past five years. They now have three sites. That's pretty exciting. It's removed some barriers and brought people to come and have a hearing of the gospel, which is what our focus is. So now I'm going to invite, I, I need Andrew to come on up, and I need Susan to come on up, and I need you to grab the mic on your way up here. Andrew Mur Murphy and Susan Oliver are two of our name change team members. are going to come up and do a quick Q&A with us just to give us some information here. All right, come front and center, you two. There we are. Okay, so first of all, can you tell us how the congregation can get involved? Because we've had that name wall. We took that down. We're trying a new thing. Yep. We're doing new things. How now can our congregation and Gander Baptist get involved in our new name change? Um, well, we're really happy with the participation of the church so far, um, although there have been some funny very comical it's submissions, fair. That's fair. Um, but <laughs> we still want to include everybody in the process, so we're, in, we're extending um, the ability for people to submit. So there's still the, uh, the box in the back there, so if people want to write a submission and put it in there. We're also going to take online submissions so that Gander can be involved in the process. Mm. Um, so you can just submit an email with your name suggestion to office at westendbaptistchurch.ca. I think you can find that on our website as well. I think so. Mm -hmm. um, if you, Facebook, if you social media, it. yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or call the church. Yeah. 
Okay. Absolutely, that works too. Yeah. Yes, that's excellent. So Susan, what else did we need to know now as a church moving forward? What words would you give us then? Oh, uh, the deadline. The We've deadline. got a new deadline. We changed it. Yes, we upped the date. Um, that was a great start. The wall got us thinking. And you know, don't discount the humor no, because we, it got everybody looking at the wall going, oh, look at that one. Well, how about this? So we got a lot <laughs> of really valuable ideas. Um, what was the question? I'm a little foggy. New deadline. From, yes. A little you, foggy you from yesterday. just come off a powerlifting <laughs> competition. Yes. Um, so we wanted to extend it. Now that people are talking, we wanted to extend it for everybody and for Gander as well. So May 12th, May 12th. is our deadline. So May 1-2, not 2-4. So May 12th. 12th is the deadline. And then we will come together again as a committee and look at the new suggestions with our other suggestions. That's wonderful. I want to thank you both for serving on the team and the other members as well. Can we give them a hand as they go down? Thank you. Thank you. Now, something that Pastor Rob Nyland said to me at the end of our conversation really struck me. It really kind of brought it home for me. He said, God gave people new names when he was doing something new in their lives. We see many examples of that in scripture. He's into the name change business, God is. He's giving new names. He gives us new names when we come to Christ and put our faith in him. We become his beloved. We become part of his family, his daughter, his son. He gives us a new name. This is the business he is in and, and new names for a new season and a new chapter in our church. And I like that. We are in a new season in the life of our church, and God is doing a new thing. Do you perceive it? Do you perceive it? Yes. yes. I know he wants to do new things in the life of our church, and he wants to do new things in all of our lives as individuals as well. And my question is, will we, to use an earlier quote, See God's grace in the past, in the former things, as a springboard so that we view neither present nor future with fear, but with expectation. Let's pray. Jesus, you're all about making things new. We thank you. That when we put our faith and trust in you, you say the old is gone and the new has come. And I just thank you, Father, for the work that you want to do in each one of our lives. I think of the new things that you are challenging people here in their own lives to do. To, to do new things. Maybe it's a new behavior. Maybe it's a new relationship. Maybe... It's a new perspective. Maybe it's a new career. Maybe it's a new choice that needs to be made. Maybe it's a new path you're wanting to put them on. I pray that you would just give them the courage to step out in obedience to what you may be calling them. And we know your Holy Spirit will give us the power to do the new things that you're calling us to. And you will provide what we need. And I think of us as a church and all the new things that is happening, that are happening in the life of our church and in Gander Baptist. Lord, you are doing a new thing and we all perceive it and we want to join you. And I pray just as you um, provide for your people in the desert, God, that we wouldn't look at our circumstances as anything to hold us back from moving forward, but that you will provide streams of water in the wasteland, that you will give drink to your people, that you will provide for us all that we need in order to uh, allow you to work through us to do a new thing. We pray all of this in Jesus' powerful name. Amen.